The Minnesota Vikings are perhaps the most cursed franchise in the NFL. Other teams like the Browns or Bills can make their cases, but they've either always been bad or simply had their biggest heartbreaks bunched up into one small stretch of time. The Vikings, on the other hand, have always been consistently just good enough to get their hearts broken at the highest levels. From Brett Favre throwing across his body to more than one kicker choosing the worst possible moment of the season to miss a field goal, there is no shortage of disappointing playoff losses. But even worse yet, the franchise has a litany of players whose careers were cut short before reaching their full potential because of injuries. Percy Harvin, Teddy Bridgewater, Sam Bradford, and of course, Dante Culpepper. Culpepper was the complete package at quarterback. Standing at a hulking 6 foot 4, 260 pounds, Culpepper had a supremely strong arm, throwing some of the prettiest deep balls you will ever see. Even at his size, he was extremely nimble and mobile as well. And unlike a lot of the athletic mobile quarterbacks of the era, he was also one of the league's most accurate passers. At just 27 years old in 2004, he had one of the most impressive passing seasons ever. And then his career was basically over. Sure, he hung around for a handful of years after that, but he was clearly never the same. So what happened? First, let's take it back to the beginning. Culpepper always had football flowing in his blood, as former Cowboys linebacker Thomas Hollywood Henderson is his uncle. However, that doesn't mean his upbringing was smooth sailing. He was born in a jail cell where his mother was serving 15 years for armed robbery. At one day old, he was adopted by Emma Culpepper, who worked at the correctional facility. As one of 15 children Emma had adopted, Dante stood out by excelling in football, basketball, baseball, and weightlifting at Vanguard High School in Ocala, Florida. He averaged over 19 points, 11 rebounds, 5 assists, and 3 steals on the hardwood. But he was obviously better on the gridiron, throwing for 6,107 yards and 57 touchdowns in 3 years. He was named Mr. Football in the state of Florida in his senior season, as he led the Knights to an undefeated season and to the state championship game against Bradenton. Down two on the final drive, Culpepper successfully converted a 4th and 20 with his legs, breaking countless tackles along the way and setting up his kicker for the game-winning field goal. But he missed and Vanguard lost 19-17. Culpepper was drafted by the New York Yankees in the 1995 MLB Draft, but he decided to go to college as football was his passion. However, due to low grades, big schools like Florida, Florida State, and Miami backed off initially, whereas UCF helped him reach the necessary scores to enroll. With the Knights, Culpepper shattered record books. He became just the third quarterback in NCAA history to top the 10,000-yard passing mark and the 1,000-yard rushing mark in his career. He accounted for 108 total touchdowns across four seasons, and his 12,459 total yardage mark ranked second on the NCAA's all-time list when his career ended. In his senior season, he broke Steve Young's single-season completion percentage record by 2.5 percentage points. This record held for a decade and still stands sixth despite the recent passing explosion. He won the Sammy Baugh Trophy given to the nation's best passer, and he finished sixth in Heisman Trophy voting. Culpepper was the fourth quarterback selected in the 1999 NFL Draft, going 11th overall behind Tim Couch, Donovan McNabb, and Akili Smith. With the pick they received for trading Brad Johnson to Washington, the Vikings selected Culpepper despite setting numerous offensive records the year before with Randall Cunningham under center, who was first-team All-Pro and second in MVP voting. However, Minnesota was proven correct in wanting a backup plan for the 36-year-old, as he threw nine interceptions in five and a half games, in which the team started two and four. But he was benched for journeyman Jeff George, who finished the season third in EBA per play, as he led the Vikes to an 8-2 record. He even threw seven touchdowns to one pick across Minnesota's two playoff games. A contract dispute coupled with the team's confidence in Culpepper, however, meant the Vikings could afford to let George walk and finally let their first rounder take over in 2000. He opened by tossing just one score to four picks in his first two games, but he also ran for three second-half scores against the Bears in a double-digit comeback Week 1 win. The Vikings started the 2000 season 7-0 behind Culpepper, with six of those wins being by one score. The streak was the fourth-longest winning streak by a quarterback to open a career ever. The last such clutch win culminated with an insane across-the-body chuck by Culpepper to Randy Moss for the game winner. Culpepper and Moss combined to perform perhaps the most perfect pairing of a quarterback's strengths and a wide receiver's strengths ever. Culpepper made 60-yard pinpoint passes look effortless, while Moss made running by and out-leaping defenders look just as easy. 
Number 11 finished the season with seven games of three or more touchdown passes, which was the eighth highest total ever at the time. He was named to the Pro Bowl as he finished near the top of every statistical leaderboard. He was fourth in completion percentage, fourth in passing yards, third in passer rating, and even tied for the league lead in passing touchdowns. As for advanced stats, he was fifth in EPA per play, third in success rate, fourth in passing DVOA, third in passing DYAR, and second in yards per attempt. Minnesota went 11-5 and, and earned a first round bye. Against the Saints in the divisional round, Culpepper accounted for 353 yards and three scores in the blowout win. His 120.6 passer rating is tied for the sixth highest ever in a playoff debut. Unfortunately, he had his worst career game in his biggest career game, a 41-0 loss to the Giants in the NFC Championship. His 13.7 passer rating was the lowest of his career, even including his later years. He turned the ball over four times, but the Vikings were doomed from the start, as they trailed 14-0 before Culpepper even touched the ball. Besides, if your defense gives up five scoring throws to Kerry Collins, you probably deserve to lose. Speaking of porous defense though, that was something Culpepper had to put up with during his entire playing career. The Vikings defense ranked dead last in DVOA in that 2000 season. They improved the following year all the way up to third worst in the NFL. In 2002, they jumped up to merely the fifth worst defense in football. They were a respectable 17th place in 2003 before falling back to 31st in 2004. So in Culpepper's five full years starting, the Vikings had a bottom five defense four times. Embarrassing. So even while Culpepper was at times up and down with his play, the main reason the Vikings didn't make another serious playoff run was their play on the other side of the ball. That said, Culpepper did indeed struggle over the next two years. His touchdown percentage was cut nearly in half in 2001, as he threw just 14 scores to 13 picks in 11 games, seven of which the Vikings lost as they missed the postseason for the first time in six years. But there were still flashes of greatness, such as against the Bucks when Culpepper led the Vikings on a 96-yard game-winning drive capped off by a helicopter TD run by the QB himself. The team also got a little bit of revenge on the Giants on Monday Night Football, as Culpepper threw four touchdowns including two in the fourth quarter in a comeback win. Alas, 2001 was when the injury issues began for Culpepper, as he missed the final five and a half games due to his knee. The struggles only piled up in 2002 as Culpepper led the league with 23 interceptions and also tied the NFL record with 23 fumbles. The Vikings playoff hopes were once again dashed with an 0-4 start. Again, however, the clutch moments of brilliance remained. In their first win of the season versus Detroit, Culpepper scrambled around in the backfield like he was Steve McNair in the Super Bowl before firing a dime to Randy Moss around multiple defenders at the goal line, setting up the game-winning TD. Against the Saints in their ugly gold uniforms, the Vikings went on a 73-yard drive while down seven, finishing with a Culpepper to Moss TD. But instead of sending the game to OT, Minnesota decided to go for two. Culpepper dropped the shotgun snap, but quickly recovered and ran up the gut to win the game. If nothing else, Culpepper was electric as a runner in 2002. He ran for 609 yards and 10 scores that season, the latter of which is the eighth most ever for a quarterback in a single season. His 2,323 rushing yards from 2000 to 2004 made him just the third quarterback to rush for 2,300 yards in a five-season period after Randall Cunningham and Steve McNair. Culpepper returned to his Pro Bowl form in 2003. He was third in completion percentage, third in touchdown rate, third in passer rating, second in yards per attempt, and second in success rate. The Vikings compiled more than 6,200 yards, and Randy Moss led the league with 17 TD receptions. However, all that will be remembered from that season is how spectacularly Minnesota fumbled it away. They became just the second team in NFL history to miss the playoffs after starting the season 6-0. The Vikings just needed to hold on to a 17-6 lead with under 7 minutes to go against a 3-12 team riding a 7-game losing streak to win the NFC North. But alas, Josh McCown led the Cardinals on a touchdown drive with 2 minutes left, they secured the onside kick, and on a 4th and 25 with 4 seconds left, you know what, I'll just let Paul Allen take over from here. Here it is. The season's on the line. Two receivers left and right. McCown takes the snap. He steps up. He's all by himself. Fires into the end zone. Caught! Touchdown! No! No! 
The Cardinals have knocked the Vikings out of the playoffs. I believe it was caught by Nate Poole. He's being mugged by his Cardinal teammates. There are Minnesota Vikings crying on the field. But from that heartbreak came Culpepper's masterpiece of a 2004 season. The Vikings started the year 5-1 with Culpepper tossing five scores in three of the team's first five games. He set the record for most scoring throws in a team's first five games of a season, and nearly two decades later only Peyton Manning and Russell Wilson have bested his mark of 18. His 1,766 yards were also the third most ever during that stretch at the time, and it now stands ninth all time. He had the deep ball working better than ever in those games against the Cowboys, Texans, and Saints. He threw two 50-yard scores in the win in Houston, the first looking far too easy to Moss per usual in the fourth quarter, and the second being the game winner in overtime to Marcus Robinson. To put things into context, after that hot start, Culpepper was on pace for a 6,000-yard, 61-touchdown season. The craziest part of Culpepper's success that year was that Randy Moss missed extensive action. He was inactive for three games and didn't catch a pass in two others. In that five-game stretch, Culpepper completed 68% of his passes with 9 TDs and 3 picks, good for a pace of 4,000 yards, 31 scores, and 10 INTs. A drop-off, sure, but still numbers of one of the best QBs in the league regardless. Speaking of drop-offs, however, the Vikings as a team did indeed suffer one, largely thanks to their defense. They had a three-game losing streak after their hot start and lost four of their final five games of the season, finishing 8-8. Eight eight. The Vikings were swept by the division rival Packers, losing both games by a score of 34-31 via a Ryan Longwell field goal as time expired. Culpepper combined to throw for 648 yards, seven touchdowns, and zero turnovers in those two games, but it wasn't enough. They would have their chance at revenge, however. They somehow still found themselves in the playoffs as a wildcard team and as fate would have it, facing Green Bay. For the third consecutive game against the Packers, Minnesota scored 31 points, but this time the D actually stepped up, holding their opponent to just 17. Culpepper threw four touchdowns in the win, which has also became known as the Randy Moss Mooning Game. Culpepper is one of just 13 players ever to have multiple playoff games with three or more TD passes and zero INTs. The only guys with more are Brady, Mahomes, Rodgers, Flacco, Breeze, Manning, and Montana all Super Bowl MVPs, so pretty solid company. The overmatched Vikings lost handily in Philadelphia the next week, but that should not mar Carl Pepper's outstanding season. He led the league in passing yards with 4,717. He was also third in yards per attempt, so it wasn't just volume. He was third in EPA per play, second in success rate, second in completion percentage, second in passer rating, second in DVOA, second in DYAR, and second in passing TDs with 39. Notice a trend there? Yeah, if it were not for Peyton Manning having the greatest passing season ever, Dante Culpepper would have been the runaway winner for MVP in 2004. Alas, somehow Michael Vick was the quarterback who stole an MVP vote from the GOAT, but that's a discussion for another time. Culpepper's numbers weren't just good for 2004, however. They were pretty historic. His passing yard at Chota was the fifth best ever at the time. His 5,123 combined passing and rushing yards broke Dan Marino's single season record that had stood for 20 years. His 69.2 completion percentage was 5th best in NFL history at the time, as ranked his 39 touchdown passes. His 110.9 passer rating ranked 4th best. He was the first quarterback ever to throw for 4,000 plus yards while completing 69% of his passes on 8.5 yards per attempt, and only 4 more have joined him since. Only Peyton Manning in that same season had more 5-plus TD pass games in a single season ever than Culpepper's 3. Only 12 QBs have more such games ever in their entire careers. Culpepper had 28 more touchdowns and interceptions in 2004, which is the 18th best differential in NFL history. Of the 17 guys ahead of him, 12 won MVP in that season, while another 3 missed out on the award thanks to somebody else on the list. Culpepper holds franchise records for his passing yardage, touchdown pass, and passer rating marks that season. His yards per attempt mark sits just behind Randall Cunningham's in 1998. No matter how you shake it, Culpepper's 2004 was an all-time season, and it only looks better with age. After the 2004 season, Culpepper famously said that the game had slowed down so much for him that he felt like a Jedi Knight. 
Well, if he was a Jedi Knight, then consider the 2005 season Order 66. Moss was traded and the Vikings got off to a horrendous start. Culpepper turned the ball over a whopping 10 times in the team's first two games, both double-digit point losses. His eight interceptions were the second most in a player's first two games of the season with zero TD passes. He flashed in a week three win over New Orleans, but then took nine sacks and turned the ball over five more times in the next two games. Then, on a scramble against Carolina, he took a shot to the knee from Chris Gamble. Turned out he had torn his ACL, MCL, and PCL. He finished the season with six touchdowns, 12 interceptions, and a 2-5 record. Backup Brad Johnson took over and led the team to six consecutive wins, just missing the playoffs at 9-7. Culpepper was allegedly unhappy with the emergence of Johnson, and the Vikings were unhappy that Culpepper was rehabbing in Florida rather than Minnesota. Add in the fact that Culpepper allegedly played a part in the Vikings' love boat scandal, and it was clear that this marriage was better off severed. Culpepper requested a trade and the Dolphins granted his wish, surrendering a second round pick to acquire him. The team initially debated between bringing in Culpepper or free agent Drew Brees, who was also recovering from a serious injury at the time. Miami's medical team decided Culpepper was the better gamble, no pun intended. It didn't take long for the team to regret this decision, as fans began chanting backup quarterback Joey Harrington's name by week two due to Culpepper's struggles. Miami started 1-3 under Culpepper, scoring under 13 points per game. He injured his shoulder in a loss to the Texans, and Nick Saban decided to rest him until it fully healed, which spurred a loud argument between the two during practice. In late November, Culpepper underwent further surgery on his previously injured knee to remove a piece of loose cartilage that had been bothering him. To make matters worse, Breeze was named first team All-Pro as he led the downtrodden Saints to the NFC Championship and went on to have a Hall of Fame career. Culpepper's surgery was more serious than originally led on, holding him out through minicamp. The Dolphins instead traded for Trent Green, and Culpepper asked for and was granted his release. He signed with the Raiders as insurance while number one overall pick Jamarcus Russell held out, backing up Josh McCown. He wound up making his season debut against his team from the previous year in Week 4. He only completed five passes in the blowout win over the Dolphins, but that was all he needed to do. Two of those completions went for scores, and he also ran for three more touchdowns. He and Jake Plummer are the only two players in NFL history to throw two-plus touchdowns and run for three-plus touchdowns in the same game. Culpepper only started six games as a Raider and finished the season on injured reserve with a quad injury that some rumored he suffered while racing teammate Stanford Rout in practice. As a free agent, he turned down a deal from the Packers in April, saying the one-year $1 million offer was not good enough. He worked out for the Steelers when Charlie Batch went down in camp, but they opted for Byron Leftwich instead. Culpepper then said he would sign with Green Bay if they would have him, but they did not offer him a deal. Feeling spurned, Culpepper opted for an early retirement, saying no team would offer him a legit opportunity and he didn't want to wait for another injury. Well, in October, he met with two teams that suffered such an injury, the Chiefs with Bertie Croyle and the Lions with John Kitna, whom he ultimately signed with. For just a minute, Culpepper and second-year receiver Calvin Johnson showed some flashes of Culpepper to Moss, but Culpepper only started five games for the 0-16 Lions before suffering another shoulder injury. He re-signed with Detroit hoping for a chance to start, but they went with number one overall pick Matthew Stafford. Culpepper started the final five games of his NFL career in 2009, once again all losses. Culpepper then signed with the Sacramento Mountain Lions of the United Football League, then in its second season in 2010. There, he won Offensive Player of the Week twice, including when he led a double-digit fourth-quarter comeback win against the Florida Tuskers, with three touchdowns, including the game-winner on an old-fashioned deep ball to Rod Windsor. Liking what they saw, the 49ers brought in Culpepper for a workout prior to the 2011 season, but they instead opted to sign his old teammate Josh McCown. Culpepper did not return to the Mountain Lions for a second season, and finally, his career was officially over. Dante Culpepper was truly a different breed. On one hand, you can say he helped pave the way for the new type of quarterback to enter the NFL. His combined passing and rushing threat at his size makes him a solid comparison for Josh Allen. Those two are two of four quarterbacks ever to pass for 60 touchdowns and run for 20 more in their first 45 career games. But on the other hand, even guys like Allen and Cam Newton couldn't quite match all that Culpepper had to bring to the table, especially for that era. 
He looked more like a linebacker than a quarterback, but few in the history of the sport threw a prettier deep ball. He was insanely accurate at all levels of the field as well. And his mobility before the injury was perhaps even more impressive considering his size. He was a wrecking ball with agility. And yet, at the peak of his prime, his career was tragically altered for good. Culpepper may very well be on his way to the Hall of Fame had it not been for that devastating knee injury. Who knows what the Vikings could have done had they not traded Randy Moss? What would Culpepper's reputation look like if he didn't have the worst defense in football for five years running? Imagine if he didn't have one of the best passing seasons ever at the same time as the greatest passing season ever. So many sad questions surrounding the career of Dante Culpepper, and all we can do is ask one question. What if?